key highlights of the week um, in terms of activities undertaken uh, by the Prime Minister and also today's briefing will cover a situation update on uh, Tigray. I am joined uh, today by the Minister for I'm Health, Her Excellency Dr. Liat Dessa, and the Commissioner for Natural Disaster Risk Management Commission, His Excellency Mitokukasa. Both will provide you with a deep dive update into health sector activities that are being undertaken within the Tigray region, and also a deep dive um, uh, input in terms of humanitarian assistance interventions that are being also undertaken in the Tigray region. So before we proceed to their part of uh, the briefing, of, uh, I just uh, briefing. want to start by highlighting, just, uh, as I indicated, some of the activities of the week. Um, key milestones or key, uh, key um, inputs milestones for the week. So on June 5, 2021, the Council, 2021 the Council of Ministers in its 97th regular meeting approved the draft budget of 561.7 billion uh, for the 2014 uh, Ethiopian fiscal year. Uh, this in comparison with the 2013 Ethiopian fiscal year budget allocation um, shows an 18% increase with due attention given to enhancing the nation's uh, productive capacity in line with the 10-year perspective plan. The, the Council plan. also discussed additional budgetary discussed allocation for the current 2013 fiscal year to cover costs related to humanitarian assistance in the Tigray region, to support to internally displaced persons, COVID-19 response expenses, uh, flooding prevention work uh, that is also being undertaken, as well as other activities. Um, on a second note of activities, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed undertook official visits to the Amhara regional state in the past few days to review launch and inaugurate large-scale national and projects, and large -scale some national of which projects, included uh, mega projects that had been launched years ago, but have remained idle um, uh, ever since. Idle, uh, so one such uh, uh, mega project which was so reviewed is the Mega Chadam uh, in the Amhara region, which is known to have been launched eight years ago, but has been left idle with uh, barren promises uh, to the people of the region. Uh, so, um, as part of this administration's so, uh, uh, experience this or commitment uh, and principle to fast tracking projects, uh, uh, the, project projects uh, the project has now accelerated and it's at uh, construction of 70%. And, and, and in the coming months will be uh, finalized for uh, availing or will be a key resource uh, to avail drinking water to Gondor City as well as um, areas within the vicinity. And um, it is hoped also that the Magach Dam will be utilized for irrigation development in the area. Another uh, key mega project Another, that was uh, inaugurated uh, that, that was, uh, had been delayed before is the Tana Bella's One Sugar Factory, which in the past three years has witnessed significant in investments uh, from the government, enabling its current operationalization. As per the original agreement signed between the Ethiopian Sugar Corporation and now the defunct Metal and Engineering Corporation, METEC, uh, this was signed in June 2012, uh, factory constructions would have been completed to begin production within 18 months. However, due to months. the overstretched delays, uh, which had become characteristic of um, uh, what is considered uh, embezzlement conglomerate as it was at that point in time, the corporation faced uh, severe financial constraints. So now the newly inaugurated factory, while entering into its first phase of regular production, concluding its trial, is expected to produce 6,000 quintals of sugar per day. And when operational, uh, fully operational in its second phase with all design considerations, it will have a capacity of producing 12,000 quintals of white sugar per day. Per day. And when operational, uh, uh, fully operational sugar, in its second uh, phase with all design nation. considerations, it will Another have a capacity of is following the 2021 Green Legacy Program launch at the national However, level on May 18, 2021 by um, Prime Minister Abiy of, um, Ahmed. Um, uh, during his visit to the region over the weekend, uh, he also joined in on the region's the Amhara the Regional States, States launching ceremony. It is to be recalled that the Green Legacy program so was initiated by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed in 2019 the with the aim of addressing environmental degradation, um, mitigating climate change, and supporting and national food security with the planting of edible seeds as well, or edible seedlings. So now in the third year, this uh, year's program ambition is 6 billion seedlings at a national level, and 1 billion uh, uh, seedlings that have been prepared as a provision to neighboring countries and as part of Ethiopia's aspirations of uh, promoting regional integration and strengthening neighborly relations. 
Another key activity during a Prime Minister's visit to the Amhara Regional State includes the inauguration of Edible Oils Production Company. As this administration continues to address the challenges for the private sector, the enabling environment that has been created through the ease of doing business measures and other interventions is supporting local investors to address the needs of the people and contributing to import substitution efforts. Um, as we all know, there's quite a, a huge uh, gap in terms of edible oil, and uh, within the past uh, two months as well, another initiative, a private sector initiative to avail edible oils uh, en masse had also been inaugurated, so this is also a continuing uh, milestone in that regard. Last but not least, yesterday, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed received the President of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, where both uh, leaders presided over the signing ceremony of the historic telecom licensing agreement between the government and the Global uh, Partnership for Ethiopia, which is a consortium of five leading global mobile operators. In 2018, uh, this administration announced the commitment to liberalize uh, the telecom sector, which initiated a major policy uh, shift. So delivering on that commitment in late May 2021, the Council of Ministers approved the granting of one license to the consortium, the Global Partnership for Ethiopia. And uh, the Council of Ministers also set a direction for uh, the Ethiopian Telecommunications Authority to expedite the process of granting the second license. So yesterday was uh, in of itself a very historic day for Ethiopia with the conclusion of the signing of the agreement. I will now proceed to the second component of today's briefing, uh, which is uh, on the Tigray region. And just uh, to give an initial statement on that before we proceed to the deep dive on the two issues that I mentioned, um, I want to reiterate a few points. So some of uh, the issues had been covered extensively in last week's briefing, but uh, just to re-emphasize some key uh, components for this briefing. Uh, one of the things is, number one, the continued calls for access or humanitarian access still seem to ignore that unfettered humanitarian access to the region had been granted months ago. And um, already there are many actors um, on the ground that His Excellency Mitukukasa will be able to elaborate upon further, but that are uh, operationalizing and uh, uh, imparting upon their responsibilities to provide humanitarian assistance. The second point I want to emphasize is the continued uh, media citations of very few individuals as evidence for a region-wide conflict are again unfounded. As shared in last time's briefing as well and per um, inputs received from the Ministry of Defense, the counterinsurgency operations by the Ethiopian National Defense Forces are still concentrated only in two areas where the outlawed operatives are active and the terrorist group's occasional attacks outside of these areas to give the impression of region-wide conflict is mere amplification, amplification of the narrative propagated by a group declared terrorists by the House of People's Representatives. So this being a constitutional organ representing more than 100 million people in the country. The third point I wanna emphasize is the continued call by leaders of the terrorist cell um, that had been ongoing before to those in the region to arm themselves as testimony to the group's destabilizing mission while the federal government has on several occasions offered amnesty to lay down arms and return to normal life because the purpose of the rule of law operations has always been to, appre to apprehend uh, the cell or the um, uh, key uh, leadership of the terrorist cell. The fourth factor that I want to emphasize is the Tigray Emergency Recovery Plan, ERPT, which is being developed by the government together with uh, partners will be launched soon. So there will be further elaboration on what this uh, emergency recovery plan entails. However, this is something that's in the pipeline and in discussion with partners as well, but uh, for some reason seems to be um, overlooked. Um, the response plan builds on existing successful whole of government approaches and aims to strengthen and scale up development and emergency programs and community structures. Number five, um, the Ministry of Education had already announced this, but again, to amplify that message for those that have not heard, all schools in Magale are open with the exception of those that have been designated to host internally displaced persons. Per Ministry of Education, all schools in Adwa, Adigrat, and other cities are already registering students and opening up. The Ministry of Education is currently in discussions with the Tigray uh, Regional Provisional Administration on extending up the upcoming 12th grade examination as the students in the region have to cover three semesters that had been disrupted due to COVID-19 before uh, they're able to sit for the exams. 
And one last point that I want to emphasize again is, I had mentioned it again in the last briefing, but the fake allegations on utilization of chemical weapons, uh, which are still being uh, reverberated and utilized um, to try to influence international opinion. So these are within the package of fake news and misinformation and disinformation that we had touched upon the last time. So with continued notable steps being taken, aims to politicize the Tigray situation at a, glo at a global level, uh, we still reiterate that it's not constructive or helpful. It may benefit a handful of the terrorist group and embolden them in their destructive mission and the vicious cycle that they have entered into, but it does not support the people of the region, nor does it support Ethiopia at large. The rightful direction of pressure needs to be towards a withering terrorist cell that now only thrives via social media bravado and entities that think it can be resuscitated. Channeling this energy towards supporting the provision administration and the federal government will be helpful to the people of Tigray and to the nation overall. Ethiopia continues to stand to be open and willing, construct and, uh, willing to constructively engage with all partners in responding to the needs of our people within the region. It aspires to work very closely and harmoniously and constructively with partners to enable the growth of Ethiopia and the prosperity of its uh, people. So with these initial remarks, I will give the floor now to Dr. Lia from the Ministry of Health, followed by Metukukas of the National Disaster Risk Management Commission for a deep dive into what I mentioned earlier as the health sector activities within the region and the humanitarian assistance activities within the region. Thank you. Thank you, Bilani. Good afternoon, everyone. As part of the government's efforts to restore and recover services in uh, Tigray region, the Minister of Health and its agencies have been working on the recovery and response of the health system in Tigray, led by a task force that's dedicated for this effort. And this task force has been, work, is, has been working uh, closely with the Regional Health Bureau Interim Administration and to assist this, various professional experts have been deployed from uh, the national institutions into the region and supporting the, providing technical assistance, supporting the regional health bureau's efforts. One of the first focus areas in terms of uh, the recovery and response in the health system is uh, the functionality or resuming functionality of health facilities. Currently, 55% of the hospitals and 52% of the health centers in the region have been made functional. If you have seen our report last week, it was, the figure was about 46% for both health centers and hospitals, which is 52% currently, because the past one week, 10 more health centers have become functional. And in those functional health facilities, more than 95% of the health workers are actively engaged in their day-to-day -day work. For the remaining health facilities, evaluation has been done on the extent of damage and currently fund has been allocated by the federal government to maintain and restore services in 14 hospitals and 58 health centers. The other focus area within the functionality uh, to restore services is providing needed equipment. And for this, 40 health center kits have been sent to the region, each kit being able to equip one health center and out of these 14 have been used to restore services. And in addition, some equipment have been deployed, including two mobile x-rays, ultrasound, six mechanical ventilators, which have been sent to different hospitals in uh, Magale, Kuiha, Shire, and Abi Addi. And additionally, 47 mic mic microscopes are being distributed from the Ethiopian Pharmaceutical Supply Agency hub in Magale to different facilities. So far, over 310.8 million worth of medicines and medical equipment has been delivered to different facilities by the Ethiopian Pharmaceutical Supply Agency of the Minister of Health. And a total of more than 215 million bur has also been transferred by the ministry and its agencies for the response, recovery activities, and continuity of various health programs in the region. The second focus area, especially in the areas where facilities have not yet been restored, is using mobile teams. Along with the efforts made to make health, func health facilities functional, currently 65 mobile health and nutrition teams, each consisting of six to eight health professionals, 
have been established both by government and by partner organizations coordinated to deliver health services to the community, especially focusing on services for mothers and children, providing various services like immunization and antenatal care and other uh, key, uh, key essential services in several oradas. In the last two months, 75,000, more than 75,000 under five children were screened for malnutrition, both in facilities and by mobile teams. And for the children diagnosed with severe malnutrition, which were accounting around 4% or 2,780 children, have received outpatient therapeutic feeding and some uh, being in stabilization centers. Through the functional health facilities and the mobile health teams, the past two months, more than 409,000 people have received services, including maternal and child health services, delivery, HIV, TB, and non-communicable diseases, and others. As part of the functionality of health services, improving ambulance services is the other key area of focus because the region has also lost many of its ambulances, additional support has been given with 12 ambulances being supported by the Ministry of Health, eight supported from the different regions, and currently we have 58 ambulances operating under the Regional Health Bureau within the region. Additionally, 65 ambulances are under maintenance and efforts being made to get more ambulances through government and partners. The other key support area that's needed is more uh, delivering more vehicles to provide support both for the mobile clinic services as well as for ensuring commodity delivery to the different waradas. For this, 15 vehicles have been provided uh, by the government and additionally, many partners have been providing additional vehicles including USAID's recent delivery of 33 vehicles to the region. The other key area of focus is uh, the services that ne are needed for internally displaced persons, especially in, uh, in the uh, facilities where they are being uh, uh, kept. So in the IDP sites, essential health services are being provided for free. And in addition to the existing professionals that the region had, a total of 120 health professionals have been recruited with the support of the Minister of Health so that um, each IDP site has a full-time health professionals deployed to give services. And in uh, 17 IDP centers where we have more uh, larger population numbers, temporary clinics have been established in those IDP sites to give services to the community. The other key area that have been given focus is services for victims of gender-based violence. To provide the necessary treatment and support to victims of gender-based violence so far, around 57 health professionals both in, in different uh, prof professionals like mental health, psychosocial support, are providing services in six cities and to facilitate additional, uh, the, the needed services of physical, psychological, social, and le legal services. One-stop services have been expanded in uh, different cities, including Makale, Aksum, Shire, Maicho, and Adigrat, in addition to the one that has been operational in either university hospital. In addition to prevent and reduce the risk of uh, gender-based violence and ensure the timely response, a toll-free line has been made functional in the region for access to, to improve the access. The other focus area is resuming COVID-19 services for which COVID testing has been resumed and COVID treatment is being provided in two centers in Magali, one in Adigrat and one in Aksum hospitals. And currently, uh, Preparations are underway to open treatment centers in Maicho, Grocery, and Quiha hospitals, which will resume in a few days. In addition to the prevention and treatment activities, vaccine delivery of COVID has been expanding in the past few weeks. Of the 128,000 vaccines that were sent to the regions, to the region, currently 87,000 have been administered, out of which around 3,700 vaccinations was given for internally displaced persons. Recently, there was a shortage of oxygen that, was, uh, that had happened due to the uh, breaking down of the oxygen delivery plant of the private center in Makale. To alleviate that, oxygen cylinders, oxygen containing 308 cylinders were delivered to, to Makale and dispatched to other parts also. 
and currently the private center has been maintained and has started production. However, to ensure continuity of this, federal budget has been allocated to set up a new production facility in Magali. Overall, in this response and recovery efforts of the government and the regional uh, health bureau, uh, strong coordination is there with humanitarian and development partners, with the humanitarian cluster, by the health cluster uh, that's been laid by WHO. The regional health bureau and the Minister of Health are working in regular communication with 28 partners uh, who are working, operating in the region currently, providing supplies like nutrition, emergency kits, and providing also service delivery in some areas. So we'd like to take this opportunity to thank all our partners, individuals, both in country and abroad, and all stakeholders who are supporting this government's efforts to reach our people during this difficult time. As you have seen, there are many encouraging progresses, but still many challenges remain, both to restore services and ensure access of health, ser health service delivery. And I use this opportunity to again urge all to continue their support in all aspects. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I brief you on uh, five areas. The first one, humanitarian assistance. The second, coordination mechanism. The third one, humanitarian access. The fourth, recovery and rehabilitation. And the final, and the fifth one, major challenge. Uh, let me begin with humanitarian assistance. Since the law enforcement operation completed, food and non-food items were delivered for 4.5 million beneficiaries in the first round and have been delivered for 5.2 million beneficiaries in the second and third round. 170,798 metric ton of wood, which, which costs 5.4 billion Ethiopian or 135 million USD distributed so far. The food distributed in the region for the first and second round covered by both government 70% and partners 30%. Since the third round, six operators, namely World Lead Food Program, World Lead Vision, Care International, Relief Society of Tigray, REST, Food for Hungary, FH, and the Government of Ethiopia are providing food assistance in the region. Out of the 93 waradas or districts in the region, WFP covers 21 Waradas, or 22.58% of the total Waradas in the region, in the north, western, and south, southern zone of the region. World Division covers seven Waradas, 87.3%. Care International covers six Waradas, 6.45%. Uh, REST covers 40 Waradas, 43.01%. Food for Hungary, FH covers five Waradas, 5.38%. Government covers 14 waradas. It is 15.05 percent of the total area coverage of the region. WFP covers the north, western, and southern zone of the region. World Division covers the eastern and southeastern zone. Care International covers central and eastern zones. Rest covers central, north, western, Shirenda Selassie, Taita Kararo. Southeastern and southern zones of the region. FH covers the, in the central zone, and government covers the western part of Tigray. This is allocation uh, which has made to allocate the food distribution for all operators which are working in Tigray regional state. Regarding food supply and distribution, World Food Program WFP addresses 18.18.3 percent of the beneficiaries. World Division addresses 5.80 percent of the beneficiary. Care International address 6.28 percent. REST address 54.6 percent. FH 5.98 percent. Government Ethiopia 8.7 percent of the beneficiary. In general, Himata partners, the five operators, covered 84.9 percent of the orders and addresses 91.3% of the food 
supply and distribution. Whereas, 50.05% of the orders and 8.7% of the food supply and distribution is covered and addressed by the government of Ethiopia. The role of the government is confined to monitoring, creating conducive environment for partners, and mainly focusing on recovery and rehabilitation activities. This shows how the government of Ethiopia has been working closely with partners and creates conducive environment for remote partners. I would like to stress one beneficiary number. Currently, the report from Himatian Partners has been released indicating that 5.2 million or 90% percent of the population of the region needs immediate humanitarian assistance. While we are looking at the breakdown of the, these 5.2 million people, we can observe that 1,010,752 people are productive safety net beneficiaries and 40,000 336 are Eritrean refuge. These two programs, namely PSNP and Refuge Program, have their own resources, which should not be included in the beneficiary list for humanitarian assistance. Regarding the non-food items, more than 98,562 emergency shelter and NFI kits, including 41 grab holes, which is estimated to be more than 796 million bir or 60 million USD has been supplied to cover more than 492,810 IDPs. This is significant, there is significant gap in the non-food items. The partner covers only 33% of the total requirement. Ministry of Health, Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs, and the Ministry of Culture and Tourism has have delivered security songs of food and non-food items that they collected from various sources. Women and children have been given due attention so that CSCB, nutritious food, and emergency medicine have been delivered using air transport to carriers like Shire and Makale. To supply safe water, to the IDPs and communities, the Ministry of Water has deployed more than 120 water trucks. In Burr, more than 75.6 million, which cover to serve more than 621,000 people in the region. More than 300,000 people are supplied hygiene and sanitation facility to protect potential sanitation and hygiene related risks in the areas where the people are the most vulnerable. The Federal Ministry of Agriculture has been allocated 10 million Ethiopian birth to strengthen the Regional Agriculture and Natural Resources Bureau. Additional supports are undergoing with the coordination of Regional Agriculture and Natural Resources Bureaus, 322,864 quintal of fertilizer from Port Djibouti, and 214,864 quintal carryover from last season, a total of 500. 37,728 quintal fertilizer has already made available and 210,795 quintal distributed. Regarding seed supply, 73,440 quintal has been purchased and transported to, to the region. Partners has allocated 71.9 million for livestock restocking. The Ministry of Education has been allocated 95 million to reopening the schools. The ministry has dispatched 1 million face masks to the, regional, the region and installing a hand washing facility in 58 schools to promote COVID-19 protocols in the schools with the coordination of region and education cluster in the region. 72 teachers are trained on education in emergency to serve IDPs and host communities. The Regional Labor and Social Affairs Bureau, with the coordination of protection cluster, has been, work, has been providing dignity kits to women and psychosocial support to women and children in IDP sites. Refuge in the region are one of the priority areas of the government 
to maintain the safety and security, continuous supply of food and non-food supplies. In the refuge camp where access and issues that are related with safety and security, the government has taken immediate action by locating and maintaining basic humanitarian services. These are the key uh, points that I, I, I want to raise regarding humanitarian assistance. Now I proceed to coordination mechanism. Currently, the government and its partners are working closely based on the, the agreement which was signed on November 29, 2020, between government and partners on issues that related to access, coordination, and humanitarian assistance. To boost safe, efficient, and effective delivery of humanitarian assistance, Emergency Coordination Center, ACC, has been established at Makale, comprising of relevant land ministries, regional bureaus, UN agencies, bilaterals, and international NGOs. This emergency coordination center is mandated to address immediate food and non-food needs in best organized and coordinated manner. For layers of emergency coordination system, regional, zonal, Wurada and food distribution sites has been put in place in order to capture additional needs and address all supplies within short period of time. The coordination mechanism has a triple nexus approach. It combines the material development and peace building nexus is the approach that we are working on regarding coordination mechanism at a regional level. Third, humanitarian access. Regarding humanitarian access, currently the case by case clearance procedure are replaced by blanket ap approval process in order to better coordination, coordinate of food and non-food items provision across the region. That means partners are in the position to simply inform the Ministry of uh, Peace, uh, their mission, the duration they stay, and the purpose. That is the, ma the mandate of the partners to let know the Ministry of uh, Peace whenever they move to the Great Regional State. More than 202 staff members of UN agencies, international NGOs, including eight international media, have been provided an access to Tigray to support and coordinate the emergency response in the region. Now, most parts of the region are accessible and create conducive environment to speed up the delivery of food and non-food supplies to the needy people in the region. In the areas where safe movement of modern cargo strength, military escort has been taken as a right measures and last resort to get access and reach the needy ones. Visa extension has been put in place for partners who are working in the region. The extension is based on the work volume and duration in the region. Now we have been providing the three months visa to all partners which are working in the regional state. There are a few partners who are asking extension for six months. For six months, there has to be a work permit as per the law of uh, the country. Communication materials are one of the issues which has frequently been raised by partners. Currently, the Ministry of Peace has developed a guideline and calculated it to all partners to follow the direction that indicated in the guideline. The fourth point, recover and rehabilitation. Regarding recover and peace building intervention, Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Peace are closely working with EU, World Bank, and UNDP in order to build back better damaged and destroyed economic and social infrastructures in the region. The Federal Government Ministerial Committee oversees all supports and has developed a plan to support regional bureaus in a regular base by assigning experts. Currently, the federal government is working on mobilizing resources for recovery and rehabilitation of damaged and destroyed economic and social infrastructures, as well as humanitarian assistance. Internal displaced people, IDFs, have been given to attention, and three options have been sorted out. 
The first one, in those areas where peace and stability are secured, IDPs are expected to return back to their original place on voluntarily based having international IDPs guiding principles. Namely, the return process should be voluntary, it should be informed, it should be dignified, safe and secured and sustainable. Second, in areas that need further effort to ensure safety and security, IDPs who have relatives in place where they are now will be kept with their relatives for a while. Third, in cases, in cases where option one and two do not work, IDPs will stay at temporary shelter. These are the, the mechanisms that we put in place to treat and address the IDPs currently who are uh, living in temporary shelter. The last one, the challenges. These are the basic issues that we need to exert our utmost energy to solve them with our partners. The first one, access and security issues. To address few food distribution points, there are challenges. There is sporadic uh, firing uh, in few areas, few areas that, uh, that need military escort to address the needy ones uh, in the region. The second one, shortage of emergency shelter and non-food items, as I clearly indicated. In the non-food part, only 33% of the NFI, the NFI has been secured so that we need more effort to mobilize more NFI resources. The third one, challenge in coordinating matter response at zonal and world level. There is huge capacity gap at the zonal and world level that needs uh, huge support from the federal and regional as well as from the partner side. The fourth one, challenges in fulfilling supplementary food. Supplementary food is very, it is very critical for children under five and lactating and pregnant women. The last one requires substantial resources to plan and undertake recovery and rehabilitation intervention in the region. These are the five key challenges that we have been facing currently. Thank you. Okay, thank you both to Dr. Leah and uh, Mr. Kukasa. So we can open it up for uh, questions. And considering that uh, we will come back with further updates um, as uh, uh, milestones progress, uh, your questions will be within the scope of the briefing um, that have been done. We will continue gathering more information um, that might not be within the scope. So I'll open up the floor. Please um, indicate who your question is going to be referenced to so we could uh, make sure that it's well coordinated. And we'll take it in two rounds, okay. So let me start from that area. Brooke, Elias, over here, and over here. We'll do four, and then over here. We'll do five questions at a time. All right, thank you very much. My name is Brooke Abdu. I come from the Reporter newspaper. My first question goes to uh, Mr. Miteku. So recently, the UN Secretary General said that there is a potential risk of famine in Tigray. So what, what does the government have? Does the government has similar assessment of this potential risk and what is being done to reverse such kinds of risks? And my second question goes to Dr. Lea. And you've, you've mentioned some uh, activities that you're, you're doing regarding the gender-based violence in Tigray. And there are lots of reports coming from Tigray that many women are um, victims of gender-based violence, especially rapes. So the number from some reports states that there are about 1,400 victims. So what's the official figure that you have for, for, for victims of this uh, gender-based violence and what is being done for them can, can, you, can you tell us in numbers how many victims of gender-based violence received psychological and other kinds of supporters? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my first question is uh, to Motoko. Um, recently, the WFP chief, David Beasley, said um, people are dying in Tigray uh, out of hunger. Um, do you agree with this uh, statement that people are dying? Um, uh, Integrate out of hunger. Um, in connection with that, uh, Tigray interim administration officials are saying 
uh, there is anti-farming campaign, uh, obstruction of uh, farmers trying to do uh, farming activities by soldiers. They are saying breaking of farm equipment, uh, destruction of farmlands, and other issues, um, basically to create uh, farming conditions. Do you subscribe to this uh, uh, allegation that has been made by the Tigray interim administration officials? Uh, my question re uh, to um, Dr. Lea will be, um, recently the United Nations, uh, the UNFPA um, issued uh, uh, a report in which it put a projection of more than 52,000 rape victims in Tigray. Um, have you seen the report and um, from your side uh, regarding gender-based violence and uh, sexual assaults or violence, uh, have you made an assessment and uh, in connection to that, overall uh, um, conflict-related uh, victims, uh, have you made an assessment of uh, how much damage uh, they have faced? Thank you, uh, Samsung from Addis Fortune. So my first question is to uh, Mr. Metuku. You have said that uh, uh, there is a critical shortage of uh, uh, supplementary food in Tigray region right now. So uh, there is also a report that malnourishment uh, is growing and it has reached a historic high. Uh, so what measures are being undertaken uh, to reduce uh, uh, malnourishment in the region? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dawit, uh, from uh, Reuters. Uh, there have been allegations, uh, particularly from the media, that food or aid is being used as a weapon of war. What's, what's your take on that? Do you, do you agree with this kind of assessment or allegation from the media and other stakeholders? The other thing is, uh, you raised about resettling IDPs from Tigray to their, their homeland or their area. Uh, recently, there are reports, particularly from Reuters, that we are, we are being told uh, from officials from Amara region that they are going to resettle close to one mi uh, close to half million population from Amhara, wh which they claim that they were uh, displaced back in you know TPLF or by by other groups. So, how are you going to coordinate this uh, program from the regional officials, Amara regional officials? and your plan to resettle Tigrayans to their, uh, their land. Thank you. Okay, I think we can proceed uh, with those questions. Dr. Lia, perhaps you want to start addressing the ones addressed to you, and then uh, Tomituku. Thank you. Uh, so uh, in terms of the question related to the gender-based violence, as I alluded in the earlier briefing, this is one of the focus area we have uh, given to ensure that any victim, the first one would be definitely to prevent the happening of the, uh, any gender-based violence, which is, uh, requires a lot of coordination, and that's being done with the different sectors and uh, uh, one of the issues, one of the approaches we have used is to ensure that there is access to um, a reporting system and also uh, what I did not mention earlier is that there is also a dedicated ambulance service for this to ensure that there is a timely response. In terms of um, the services also uh, that is being delivered, uh, initially it was focused on the medical services but this requires also um, comprehensive services including psychosocial support and uh, other uh, rehabilitation services that may be linked to the uh, health facility services, not necessarily within the facilities. So that has, is being done in coordination with different partners, but also other sectors like women and children and youth uh, ministries and bureaus and, uh, and the social, uh, labor and social affairs and others. In terms of the numbers uh, that you have stated, and so the numbers that we get is of course from the reports that have reported to health facilities and uh, the uh, aggregate number that we've had for the last six, seven months is, uh, as you mentioned, a little over 1,000 uh, uh, cases. But the report that was mentioned um, uh, later on by uh, uh, 
uh, one uh, colleague of uh, the UNFPA report is uh, something we are not uh, aware of, but overall, in terms of the assessment related to the needs of uh, both health and uh, social issues, speci specifically the health issues, is being done regularly, but uh, with uh, different partners. So, uh, the, the, but that has been focused mostly on the needs of the um, uh, health. I mean, on the issues of the health facilities assessment, where we are now in terms of our services. So uh, we don't have uh, this uh, data, and uh, we are not aware of this data. However, the main issue is that the, the problem exists, and the services need to be strengthened in all the cities. And that has been expanded in many hospitals in the different cities I mentioned earlier to ensure that there is one-stop services, but also linked to other safe houses or rehabilitation centers that are needed, uh, that are coordinating their services with uh, health facilities. So I think the main questions uh, for me were this. Thank you. Questions? Uh, let me begin with uh, the farming, the term, the term uh, Amen. So I brought you, I bring you the terminology of famine uh, and how we declare a famine. We don't have a criteria uh, to declare whether it is famine or not. In the dictionary it says famine, extreme scarcity food, shortage and hunger. So to declare a famine, there are three criteria three criteria, which works jointly. We cannot segregate uh, one or two from the three criteria. They have to work together. Th uh, the following three things must all happen. The three criteria should be taken in together. The first one, at least 20% of household in a given area face extreme food shortage with limited ability to cope. Second, more than 30, 30 percent of children suffered from acute malnutrition. The third one is hunger causes more than two days each day for every 10,000 people. So that currently all reports are floated with the first criteria. 20 percent of the population of the region are facing for shortage. So, according to the standard, the three criteria, as I said earlier, should work together. This is the first thing. Second, we don't have any food shortage because, as I mentioned earlier, 91.3 percent of the beneficiaries have been provided by five operators which are supported by USAID. Government of Ethiopia is limited in the western part of Tigray, in Umara, Dansha, Makadra, and other western parts, so that they do have ample resource to address the needy ones in their areas of operation. Now, the challenge is how to address, how to, how to address the needy ones in at the grassroots level because there are TPL, TPLF freeman forces who ambushed in scattered area and open sporadic fire. That's the challenge. That attack the personnel, that attack the trucks with food. So that now the military, the defense force, are closely working with the regional government to create conducive environment to open up all areas to facilitate and create conducive environment for the, the, transportation, the transportation of food and distribute to the needy ones across the region. So that we don't have any food shortage. So that it, it is not time, it is not a position to declare famine in current Tigray regional state context. Regarding uh, the people dying in hunger, I think I responded it uh, during the press briefing at the Ministry of uh, Peace, so that the, the report was 
generated by UN OCHA. And what it was presented to the close meeting of UN Security Council. So the report was taken from off, from off La Warada, Quorum area. It is safe. There is no any hurdle. There is no hurdle to address the beneficiaries with operators which are working in southern Tigray. So that we checked once and twice. We found it, it is a false report which was generated deliberately by some of the NGOs which are working in the Tigray regional state. So, as I said earlier, as 91.3 percent of the beneficiaries are covered by five operators out of the Ethiopian government working area, how we can think about hunger, hunger in, and famine in the regional state? Because most of the operators are working in central, in northwestern, southern eastern part of the region. So that this is uh, uh, my reply uh, to your question regarding the famine and uh, the people is uh, dying due to uh, hunger in some parts of the regional, in the, some parts of the Tigray region. The third question about farming activities. As per the report which was circulated from the Ministry of Agriculture, 70% of the area are cultivated in mere producing areas. And as I mentioned earlier in my briefing, around 800,000 of fertilizer has already been provided to the region and the Ministry of Agriculture together with the Bureau of Agriculture are providing improved seed and allocate substantial amount of resources for restocking to purchase oxen for farming purpose. So the report, of course, it was generated by the Deputy Administrator of the Gradual State. In another uh, interview, he corrected. Corrected and he told all the uh, medias it was taken wrongly. It was taken wrongly and it should be corrected as per the next uh, information that has given by the deputy administrator of, administrator of the Tigray Regional State. The third question about supplementary food, of course, as I mentioned earlier in the challenges, we do have supplementary food shortage so that now, our, now we are closely working with 10 food complex industries which are located across the country in Addis, in Bardar, and Hawasa. So that they are ready to produce day and night more CSCB to deliver for the needy ones, especially for children under five, lactating and pregnant women. In addition, we are working closely with WFP. Target supplementary feeding program is one of the intervention areas of WFP, so that we agreed to bring uh, supplementary feed, CSCB++, from international market and distribute to the needy ones uh, across the, uh, the, the regional state, focusing on children under five and lactating pregnant women. The last uh, question is, uh, the government is using starvation as a weapon of war. So as long as, as long as 91% of the food distribution is covered by five op operators, international NGOs, local NGOs, and one international institution, how we can imagine starvation using us a weapon war? Had it been the government of Ethiopia, which controls all parts of the region, we can imagine starvation can be used as a weapon of war. But the government of Ethiopia is limited or confined only 40 waradas in western part of Tigray that are in conducive environment. So that is a practicist and should, it should be corrected based on the report, the, based on the statements that I gave you earlier on the area coverage as well as the beneficiary, the beneficiary list which are covered by 
the six operators. These are the questions uh, which was raised earlier, so that if you are not satisfied with uh, the responses, I will come back again with the second round question. Thank you to both. We'll take uh, two questions or three questions maximum from those that haven't attended. We'll give one here, one to Coletta. And if anybody else, this is your moment to show your hand if you would like to address. Okay, so we'll take two questions. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. I'm Shifar Alaka from ETV. I'd like to ask Metaku a, a couple of questions. Uh, one of the questions that I want to ask is, uh, as we know, one of the issues that Ethiopia is uh, grappling with is uh, issues of uh, clearly uh, 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 communicating uh, what is going on in the state of Tigray to the global uh, community. In this regard, what is going on? And my second question would be, now that the USA has imposed uh, uh, sanctions against uh, Ethiopia, can this uh, uh, impact the supply of aid in the state of Tigray? Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Coletta Wanjohi from FSN. Uh, Mr. Mitiku, you've explained very well the distribution uh, strategy of different uh, agencies and the government, but why do we still have disparity of numbers between the United Nations and the government of Ethiopia? The UN tends to, to denote that less people have received uh, assistance, while well, the government says 4.5 million, the US is playing at around 2.8 million, and that why are we having disparities? Then on the events of the Prime Minister for the week, President Uhuru Kenyatta was here, and uh, we know the United States has reached directly to Kenya to try and put diplomatic pressure on Ethiopia to, for a ceasefire in the north. Is that one of the issues that uh, President Kenyatta uh, discussed with uh, Prime Minister Abiy? Thank you. The, the numbers, as I mentioned earlier, we do have 5.2 million beneficiaries, 90% of uh, the population of Tigray, with four components. The Productive Safety Program, which has 1 million, 10,000. The refuge, it is 40,000. The relief, 3.5. And the IDPs, 640,000. So that the sum uh, would be 5.2 million. So now we are addressing, uh, addressing these beneficiaries with the partners, the five partners or operators which are working in Tigray, uh, Tigray region. So that the hardly is, the hardly is, there are a strong control at the checkpoints. The checkpoints have already established to control the movement of weapons, ammunition, and other unnecessary, unnecessary materials to, be pro to protect them from reaching to uh, other areas. These are the, the mechanisms that we put on place so that the, com the partners which are working with the government of Ethiopia should stick and abide, abide to the rule and regulations of the Ethiopian government. This is one of the challenge. Second, in few areas, there are transportation problems, so that the World Food Program has already provided us with secondary transport facility. So that now we are, we, things are improved on the ground, so that in the third round, in the third round, we are working closely with all operators to reach and speed up the delivery of food to all parts of, uh, to all food distribution parts in the region. Second, regarding uh, uh, constraints from uh, donors, I think we discussed thoroughly with partners, as you remember, last week, on Thursday, we had we had a meeting, a meeting with ambassadors to Ethiopia, a number of uh, countries' ambassadors to Ethiopia, UN agencies, and, and the international NGOs. We raised so many issues that need the attention from the partners, that need the attention from the government of Ethiopia. So we agreed, we agreed to solve those challenges, which we have been encountering together. There are gaps from the government. There are so many gaps from the partners. So that, as I said earlier, we agreed to solve this gap and speed up, speed up the food delivery and non-food delivery to the needy ones across the region. These are my replies. 
And I missed the, the, the one point, one question from the first round questions about IDPs. About, about IDP in uh, international standard, um, when we are uh, working on sustainable, sustainable or durable solution, there are three components or three mechanisms. The first one it is reintegration. Reintegration means sending them back to their original place. The second one is local integration. Integrate them as a place where they are now with the host community. The third one is relocation or settlement. So that now we are working on the first component. Return them to the original place wherever there is 100% secured and safe conditions. So that regarding, regarding the western part of uh, Tigray, with the initiative of the Prime Minister, a committee which has 40 members has already been established to work on return those IDPs now who are at Shire and a number of IDP sites in Tigray to send them back to western Tigray before the May rainy, rainy season starts. So that it includes the president of Amar Regional State, the Tigray interim government administrator, and a number of line ministries. So we have developed a plan. Using such a plan, now we are working heavily to send them, to send them back to the, their original place. We do have a stand, a stand, international standards. Even we have good lessons from Gadi Oguji, uh, Somali, Oromia border era conflict, so, so that we do have ample experiences. So we use as a context of the IDPs, integral regional state, to send them back, as I said later, before the rain season starts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Atom Toku. Um, in wrapping up, I will uh, address your question as well, Coletta, but also just to uh, give emphasis to some points. Um, because based on some of the questions that were raised here. Uh, number one is to affirm that uh, at the highest level, and this has also been a direction that had been set and communicated as well uh, by the Prime Minister uh, to the National Defense Force members, that the government upholds a zero tolerance policy for sexual uh, violence. And in this regard, investigations and prosecutions have been underway. If you recall, uh, in our briefing last week, the Attorney General also gave um, uh, quite a detailed um, uh, uh, overview of what had been undertaken, but investigations into these particular allegations as well as allegations of other human rights violations are being carried out by four different entities. Number one being the military court and prosecutors, number two being regional police and prosecutors, number three being the federal police and investigators and the last being uh, criminal investigations, independent ones, that are being undertaken by the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and the Ethiopian Human Rights uh, Commission, which are undertaking a joint investigation at the moment. So uh, when you're referring to some of the, the charges that have been made and the follow-up that has been made, particularly with regards to a violation or uh, of um, a sexual violent uh, nature, um, military prosecutors have pressed charges against 28 soldiers who are suspected, um, sorry, of killing in situations where there was no military necessity, but particularly when it comes to sexual violence, 25 soldiers who are um, suspected of committing acts of sexual violence and rape have been charged as the military have got their own court uh, system. So this is being um, undertaken by them. Uh, but this is just to reiterate that this is part of ongoing investigations to address uh, this critical issue. The second one uh, pertains to what uh, Dawit highlighted as uh, food being used as a weapon of war. We have affirmed um, even last week that this is not the heartbeat of this administration. Um, it's a catchy phrase, it's a catchy word to be able to um, uh, insinuate that there's challenges, but the administration would not be using in fact, the figures that have been stated so far and the interventions that have been undertaken with regards to the federal government um, 
uh, intervening with humanitarian assistance do not uh, corroborate this. So it's an unfounded allegation. And if there's any forces that are pushing for this narrative, it needs to be evidence-based because um, all of our allegations need to be supported by data as well, and none of the data uh, shows that. But more importantly, I think in terms of this charge, I think it's really, really important to understand that the people of Tigray are Ethiopians. They are our people. So there needs to be a clear differentiation between the TPLF and the people of Tigray which seems to be uh, continuously mixed up. So the rule of law operations, again, to emphasize, has been targeting a small group who have been um, behind um, or orchestrating so many um, criminal activities. But the people of Tigray remain um, Ethiopian people, and they are our people that we want to serve. So this claims of food being used as a weapon of war is really um, not in support of the people of Tigray, and it really dehumanizes the connection that this country has with the people in that region. Uh, the third statement that had been made was regards to anti-farming campaigns. Um, I had already um, kind of elaborated on this last week as well. There are no anti-farming campaigns being undertaken by the National Defense Forces. If there are certain outliers or individuals who are doing this, they don't necessarily represent um, uh, the, the, um, uh, the policy of uh, the federal government or the National Defense Forces, and there are processes to apprehend them and also put them into question. But as a policy, there is nothing uh, that relates to that. In fact, last week, if you have seen it, the UN um, FAO had indicated that they're distributing seeds and fertilizers already within the region as well. So um, again, you're seeing that there's similarity and alignment in terms of that aspect of it. And for the National Defense Forces, which I mentioned the last time as well, that have been stationed, particularly the Northern Command in the Tigray region, fighting locusts with the people of Tigray, supporting them in terms of farming, this allegation of purposefully uh, or purposely trying to obstruct uh, farming activities, again, is unfounded and needs to be corroborated. So again, if there's outliers, it cannot necessarily paint uh, that larger uh, picture. So in concluding, um, yes, uh, uh, his president, His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta was here yesterday and met with Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed uh, for the signing of the licensing agreement. Uh, among uh, other issues in which they engaged is uh, regional um, issues of common concern um, and as well as um, uh, strengthening partnership between Kenya and Ethiopia. One of these areas of strengthening the partnership, as you have seen, is that both of them, within a very short period of time, took time to plant um, as part of the Green Legacy Initiative, which I intimated earlier is part of the efforts by the federal government to go regional and to also onboard partners in that regard. So there are many issues that have been discussed of uh, mutual concern, but I want to come back to you with regards to the uh, categorization or the word or the utilization of the word ceasefire, which assumes that this engagement is an engagement of equals. It's not. As I had indicated earlier, the House of People's Representatives, which is one of the organs that represents more than 100 million Ethiopians, has deemed the organization a terrorist organization. So this is a rule of law operation now concentrated in a very small area to bring to, um, uh, to apprehend uh, leaders of the criminal uh, clique. So this insinuation of a ceasefire makes it seem as if there's a broader ongoing uh, conflict, but I have already um, indicated about that earlier. So with these questions, we'll come back to you with more um, information as uh, other uh, you know, achievements and other activities materialize. But for today, we thank you very much for your time and uh, a very good afternoon to you.